This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, Jay Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. The turkey, javelina, bison, and spring bear regulations are out. They're online. You can get them on the azgfd.gov website. And the deadline for applying for turkey... Um, and, and the other animals is October 13th. So that is, uh, next Tuesday, I believe, uh, the 13th of October, those dead, those, uh, applications are due. And, uh, for those of you applying for Gould's Turkey, uh, Rio Grande Turkey and Merriam's Turkey, uh, that those will apply to you. So get your applications in. Uh, Get them ahead of time, ahead of the deadline, um, and I wish you guys well on on the draw of that. Uh, Guys, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, GoHunt.com forward slash Insider um, has been the title sponsor of this podcast from the beginning, and um, I wanted to tell you about the special announcement that I talked about uh, last week. Um, in the last episode, I told you that there is uh, big news coming. Well, the October Insider Giveaway is uh, to win a fully guided cooster hunt. Uh, Lorenzo with GoHunt.com uh, is going to be going on the hunt in January, and he's going to be taking two Insider members uh, with him. Um, so two lucky Insider members are going to get uh, drawn and that is going to, you know, the hunt is $55 per person, plus they're giving you a $1,000 travel voucher. So that's uh, all food, lodging, and a $1,000 travel voucher. Now, the hunt is with Jar Colburn and I, Colburn and Scott Outfitters, uh, down in Sonora, Mexico. And um, Dar and I have been going down to Sonora, Mexico, hunting coos deer for many, many years, since the late 90s. And... Um, the actual hunt dates for this hunt uh, will be the 8th through the 14th. We will actually travel down on the 7th. We will hunt seven full days, the 8th through the 14th, and then depart for the U.S. border uh, on the morning of the 15th. And if you go to GoHunt.com, you can uh, see a bunch of photos and see a little promo uh, that they did with a bunch of photos of coos deer that we've shot on uh, hunts just like the one that uh, GoHunt.com is is giving away. Um, The rules, you must be an insider member to be eligible for the drawing. All current insider members are automatically entered. Only one entry per person. You must join insider by midnight Pacific Standard Time on October 31st to be eligible, 2015. On November 1st, uh, GoHunt.com is going to draw two winners and five alternates. Winners will be contacted by email or phone and will have three days to claim their prize. If winners do not respond within three days, GoHunt.com will offer the prize to an alternate. Uh, the hunt is non-transferable and the winner must hunt it themselves. Um, so uh, the I've already gotten emails and and messages from guys excited, hoping that they win the hunt. And, um, you know, it's just one of those hunts every year that uh, Dara and I love to go on. And um, it's right during the middle of the rut. We typically take two groups and we usually go from about that 7th through about that uh, 24th time frame. And, um, you know, as of today, you've got 24 days, 8 hours, 25 minutes and 32 seconds until the uh, October Insider Giveaway ends. So all you got to do is be an Insider member. Um, and, and one more thing, when you sign up for GoHunt.com uh, Insider, uh, if you use the J. Scott promo code, you automatically will get a $50 Kuyu gift card. So in essence, uh, you're signing up for 
the unbelievable resource of the insider for 99 bucks. It's $149. You get a $50 Kuyu gift card uh, that you can then purchase uh, Kuyu gear off of their website. Um, and then you get all of the uh, state strategies, species strategies, and all of the unbelievable resource that the insider provides. So, um, guys, I want to wish you the best of luck. Um, and uh, someone's going to win. You know, there's going to be two guys that win this hunt, and uh, they're going to go down with us. And uh, for an additional $300, you can uh, opt to shoot a javelina. So you can get a combo. You can get a, you can get a coos deer javelina. And um, we're looking forward to it. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Kuyu did kind of a, a similar type of thing. Uh, Brady Miller, who actually works for GoHunt.com now, um, won that hunt. Uh, it was a photo contest, and he, he, he submitted the best photo. It was voted the best photo and uh, went down and uh, hunted Cooster with us, actually took his bow and shot a, shot a really big buck, shot a 118-inch gross buck that uh, netted a little over 110, and um, he got a nice award for it uh, in the la- last uh, Pope and Young Awards period. So, um, guys, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be hunting Cooster with us in January. Um, I also want to thank uh, Deadeye Outfitters uh, for their sponsorship of this podcast. And Deadeye Outfitters is doing their annual breast cancer awareness design again. They're donating 10% of all proceeds to breast cancer research. Uh, the men's and women's shirts are currently available on their website at deadeyeoutfitters.com. Be sure to use the promo code JSCOTT to save 10% on all purchases at DeadeyeOutfitters.com. Pick up some Deadeye Outfitters and wear your obsession. Uh, I want to thank those guys for their sponsorship of this podcast. Um, Guys, you can follow along uh, the adventures uh, of Dar and I uh, on our Instagram page, at jscottoutdoors and at Dar Colburn. Uh, Dar's got some deer hunts coming up. Both sons have drawn deer tags. Uh, the next hunt on my agenda is the Arizona uh, Super Big Game Raffle uh, Desert Sheep Hunt. Uh, I will be leaving here shortly to head up for a couple weeks and um, and uh, try and uh, get uh, Frank Argo, the winner of the hunt, uh, a great ram. And uh, there's just a lot of things going on. It's an exciting time to be a hunter. Fall is always that electric time and Um, I just want to thank you guys for all your support of the podcast. And um, while I was gone in September, I was amazed at uh, how the support of the podcast just stayed steady. And, um, you know, I owe all of that to you guys for for diligently listening and and, um, telling your friends about the podcast. And I just want to thank you for that. Um, I will be updating uh, Instagram and Facebook and um, my website, jscottoutdoors.com, uh, and um, let's get right to the episode with uh, Greg Krogh. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today, we've got special friend of the podcast, Greg Krogh of Mogion uh, Rim Outfitters, and Greg has already had an unbelievable 2015 fall season, and his clients have harvested some great animals, uh, both in Nevada and in Arizona. And uh, we're fortunate to have caught Greg here at camp. They're hunting mule deer in Nevada. Greg, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How you doing, Jay? Good. Um, I know our last conversation, our last podcast episode was prior to the season, and you were anticipating a, a good season, and it looks like uh, you've already uh, exceeded that. And uh, you guys are hunting mule deer right now in Nevada? Yeah, that's correct. We just started the rifle mule deer hunt, uh, I believe, uh, beginning of day three right now. Right on. What are your conditions there in Nevada as we speak? You know, it's been, uh, the first two days have been incredible, incredible weather. It, it, we were supposed to get a bunch of rain. It never rained a drop, but it dropped the temperature about 20 degrees. So it's been uh, about as good as we could ask. How is antler growth, uh, Greg? Obviously, from a couple of the bucks you guys have already shot, it's phenomenal. But overall, is it as good as you thought it was going to be? It, it absolutely blew away our expectations this year. We had bucks that uh, inventory bucks from years past 
that put on, uh, we had one deer put on 35 inches this year, you know, in, in one year. And uh, so it, it was unbelievable. That's awesome. Now, I know you've been bouncing back and forth the last couple of months between Nevada and Arizona. And I know you came over and, and I saw some pictures of some Arizona bulls that you guys got, I believe, over in Unit 1. Looks like you guys had a real good hunt over there. How how was your hunt in Arizona for elk? Yeah, you know, I thought it was really good this year. The, the, the rut started off, it was a little slow for, I would say, the first two days. And then after that, it exploded. And uh, we had probably one of the better ruts I've seen, you know, comparable to last year in Unit 1. And from what I heard about other parts of the state, it sounded like we were pretty fortunate. I, I heard it was pretty slow in some of the other places. And, uh, we, you know, we actually did one other hunt in 10 as well on the early trophy hunt. And um, and I couldn't believe the difference between the rut in Unit 1 and Unit 10. And it, was, it seemed like it was a lot slower in 10 than it was in Unit 1. What what do you attribute that to, Greg? Because I mean, honestly, the the archery tags in Unit One, I want to say there's 300 tags, so I mean, there is a person behind every bush. Um, did you just feel like it, there was more moisture over there, or what made you, those bulls you think rutting harder than over in Ten? The only thing I can think of is is uh, there's definitely more pressure, I think, in One than in Well, I mean, Ten has a lot also, but but I don't think. I think the heat, you know, it seemed like it was a lot hotter in, in Unit 10 just because it's a more arid, you know, uh, unit than it is over there in 1. And there was definitely a lot more rain in Unit 1, and uh, it was definitely a lot greener, you know. Um, so I think the temperature was a big part of it. Um, you know, talking to guys throughout the hunt, I, was, I had a lot of friends who were hunting in Unit 10 and 9, and they were talking about how miserable and how hot it was. And, um, you know, we weren't experiencing that in 1. It was, it was cool, you know. We got... We were getting a lot of afternoon showers, you know, a lot of overcast days, and uh, the elk seemed to be screaming pretty much from the beginning of the hunt all the way through the end of it. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I was in Unit 9, and I can attest to the warm temperatures, and I think that just goes to show when it gets really warm, those elk are more lethargic. Uh, they're maybe not interacting with each other as much as, as they would be, say, if it was cooler and uh, more moisture and, and um, you know, where they're up and, and in each other's face a lot more. They probably, uh, in 9 or 10, uh, my experience was they were kind of heading to bed early and laying down a lot, whereas, uh, you know, you get a 10 or 15 degree difference, you know, after an afternoon shower, uh, it definitely gets those elk up and moving. And when they get up and moving, it seems like they do a lot of interaction with each other, which in turn, you know, just stirs everything up. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's the biggest thing with that heat, you know. Yeah. Um, Greg, I'm looking at uh, your Facebook page, and there's a Nevada bull, and it looks like uh, the hunter's name is JP, and it's a beautiful, typical 6x6. Six six. looks like a real heavy bull. He's got real nice whale tails. Um, looks like uh, guide Clay Campbell um, guide, guided for that bull. Uh, that looks like a heck of a bull. That's a 400-inch bull, isn't it? Yeah, I think they had him at 401 as a straight six, and uh, that was that was a uh, Clay Campbell, who's uh, been guiding for me for a few years, and uh, he did a phenomenal job. That was a really really rough hunt this year over there. Uh, he was the only guy we had in that unit, and um, I was hearing from everybody about how miserable that unit was this year. They weren't running at all. Uh, we talked about it on that la on, on our last conversation about how much early they run over there and. It was a completely non-existent rut. Um, you know, there was a, that was a spot and stock situation. Clay glassed him up, and he had no cows with him at all. And, and uh, they just went up there and killed him. I think it was the last day of his hunt. And it might have even been on – it was either the last day of his hunt or it was the day after the last day, I, and we talked to him in his day. And I know he was going to stay for a day or two longer. And I can't remember if he killed him on the last day or the second to last day, but it's a really good bull. Yeah, it looks like a beautiful, typical. Um, Greg, in, in your experience, when you have those years where rut is lackluster, um, my experience usually is I try and get up and get where I can see those elk and get, get my eyes on those elk. Are there any tips or tactics when they're not just going crazy? What do you try and do when it when it gets tough like that? Well, that's one thing that is, uh, 
is really fortunate about Nevada is it's real glassable, especially in that unit. That's the unit uh, 221, 222, 223 bull. And that unit's extremely glassable. So even when they're not calling, you can still hunt them. And uh, that's one of the reasons I really like that unit. And uh, so we just, we were actually Clay, not me. Clay was getting up on a big high knob and just glassing every day, morning and evening. They weren't doing any calling whatsoever. And um, they were still able to get it done on that big bowl. That's awesome. As I thumb through your Facebook here, I see uh, Bill Thomas, Drew Thomas, and Randy Elmer. Uh, looks like a 64-inch mass, 47-inch uh, inside, real wide bull, 58-and-a-half-inch main beams uh, that, that scored 391. Um, I'm assuming that's an Arizona bull uh, there? Yeah, it is. That's a unit. Uh, that was unit 10. Uh, wow, that's a heck one, of a bull. That was the 100 we had in 10 this year, and uh, Randy Elmer just started working for me uh, this year for the first time, and, and he did an incredible job. I, I was... Uh, I came out on that hunt that day. I was not there when they shot the bull. I was on a knob glassing miles away trying to find a different bull. And uh, he texted me that, uh, that that was a really slow hunt. You know, if you're, it was probably very similar to what you were like in nine. They weren't calling very much. That bull was in some really thick country. And, uh, you know, honestly, I was I was getting a little worried that Randy was, uh, was, was hunting that one bull exclusively, maybe a little bit too much. And I was afraid we were going to end up with nothing until... I took off and went somewhere else. I wasn't supposed to be on that hunt, but I started glassing more in the more glassable parts of town, trying to find a good bull as a backup in case it did work out with that bull. And he had been hunting me in the whole hunt, and uh, and uh, but I, I was up on a hill glassing, and I was not seeing very, you know, nothing that the guy would want to would want to shoot. And then he texted me that they had just hit the bull, and uh, and finally got on him on the day on day four. So I think they only saw that bull twice. I think they killed him on day five in the morning. And, uh, and it was, I think they saw him two times in five days, you know, so, and they just kept grinding it out and finally got a crack at it. He stepped out in the open and they got it. But he was with cows, but it was a lot like what you were describing in nine. He was getting to bed early in the morning and he wasn't being vocal and, uh, was not glassable. There was no place to glass that bull from. And, um, and then in the evenings, we were just really lucky. The two times we saw him, um, I say we, I mean Randy, <laughs> the two times that Randy and them saw him, was it both times it was in the evening and uh, both times he just bugled a couple of times right, you know, in the last half hour and they were able to close in on him and kind of guess where they thought he was headed and and, uh, and be starting off close enough that even though he was right at dark when he started, they were close enough they could get in there and get a shot. It looks like a heck of a bull. I mean, he's got short thirds. If there's any weakness at all, he's got short thirds, but I mean, he, he makes up for it with eye guards that tip down, the, that left eye guard tips down and if any guys want to see the pictures go on Greg's Facebook. Uh that's Greg Krogh K R O G H. And um check out on, the photo. Sorry, sorry, we also put it on Instagram. I just started an Instagram to start posting pictures. So I put one on there also. Um you know when you were talking about that both thirds, his first seconds and thirds on both sides all averaged under thirteen inches and he still ended up going three ninety one I think in seven eighths. Yeah, you know what's crazy is his his fourths are like big bladed, and even his fifths are like they almost look like a second main beam. They're so thick, and then they got kickers off them. It's just a really cool bull. Um, congrats on that. And then it looks like um, you and and guide Troy Smith were in uh, unit one uh, for the archery hunt, and looks like both bulls, um, nice bulls. Uh, looks like the one I see you in a picture, a uh, real heavy bull. Um, Got, got looks like quite a bit of mass and just a beautiful bull. Yeah, you know, those archery bulls, it was there was actually, you know, Randy was there. I haven't posted all the pictures yet. There were actually four of us. And um there was uh me, Troy, Randy Elmer, and his nephew Jeff uh Lynch. And um Jeff also killed a nice bull. I just haven't posted the picture of it yet. Uh Randy was hunting a really big bull that he had found this summer. And uh, I just ironically saw a picture of it the other day, came across, somebody sent me a picture of it dead. Somebody shot it on the early, I'm trying to track down it and figure it out. I guess somebody saw it on, a, on one of the uh, internet forums and it, it supposedly goes 437 inches. And is it, it, is it the seven by seven? 
No, is he's, it, a, uh, he's a, okay. He's got quite a bit. He's got a big kicker off the bull's right side, a sideways kicker that comes off down around the royal and the main beam, and then it splits. And then he has a he's real unique. He had a main beam that went all the way back on the bull's left side, and it flips all the way down, and almost comes back again, like a like a C on the end of you know, or a hay hook on the end of his beam. Yeah. And, and then he had an extra third. Um, that was the bull that we had were trying to hunt on the archery. We lost him and have no idea where he went. So um, I was kind of I was trying to track it down so I could figure out where they finally killed him at. It, it was uh, a bull that we lost and had no idea where he had gone. But it. Uh, so that was the bull Randy was hunting, and and, uh, and they ended up getting several other good bulls, but we lost that one early on at the hunt. And you know those bulls get when they start traveling. Like, we have no idea where he went. Oh yeah, they can move crazy amount of distance. Um, then I'm looking at Jason Campbell's um, buck. He shoots a 220 inch mainframe, 232 and an eighth uh, gross. Uh, just looks like a tote of a buck. Um, I know uh, Jason is a good friend of yours. Um, tell me about that buck. You know, that was a buck that I found this summer uh, when scouting with my daughter. And um, we had, you know, we didn't realize he was that big. He's got, I don't know if you can tell in the pictures, but he's got giant eye guards and then they're split. Um, and he's got one little kicker. And other than that, it's all, you know, it's all eye guard, the split eye guards and the kicker. We, we hunted that buck from the start of the hunt. Uh, Jason hunted him for 10 days with me, the first 10 days. We didn't get him killed. We were, gosh, I think Jason was within, I think he got 80 yards from him once, 70 yards, 60 yards, 34 yards, and one day even seven yards, and we never drew our bow on him. Um, wow. Something happened every time. Either there was another deer that prevented it, or uh, one time, um, uh, yeah, there was another deer off the side, and, and he couldn't draw, and we just, he never got a shot when his 10 days were up. Uh, Jack Brittingham was there, and um, so he started hunting him. And then Jack, on his first morning, uh, the buck ended up getting in a really good spot, hanging out for like an hour out in the middle of a, uh, a little tiny burn. And uh, Jack snuck in on him and, and uh, got a shot on him and missed him. And uh, <laughs> he had, uh, he's, he's still sick about it. it. He doesn't miss very often. Uh, he, I think he claimed on his Facebook page that uh, – that uh, he had a little bit of the fever. And uh, so he missed him, and then uh, we hunted him the entire month. I mean, we hunted, we never, I never left that buck for the entire season. And uh, and then we ended up finally getting him on the muzzleloader hunt. And, um, we, you know, I wish we'd have killed him with a bow, but I'll take it anyway, you know. And uh, Jason killed him on the very last day of the muzzleloader hunt. And, um, and it was the last day he could have possibly hunted him. And, uh, when he killed him, he was five yards from the tree line walking to it. So we just about didn't get that deer this year. So, and, uh, nice. Jason just kept grinding it out till the end. So I'm, I'm really glad he did that buck. Until you hold it in your hands, you just can't believe how big he is. It's the pictures don't do him justice. Uh, his mass is, he just carries it all the way out. And, uh, all of his points are heavy, everything about him. That was the deer that grew. I want to say that deer grew at least 35 inches and maybe even 40 over last year. And I think he was went from six and a half to a seven and a half year old deer, which, you know, that's not normally that giant jump, you know, I think that was mostly feed. Um, he just, he picked up that extra and, and he, and he grew just an incredible amount of mass last year. Yeah. That looks like an awesome buck. I can't wait to see that one in person. Um, and then speaking of Jack, I mean, man, he shot a he shot a big giant typical and a and a and a giant non typical. Tell me about those. Uh, the non typical was a buck. Again, I found with my daughter this summer. Uh, she was with me on the two two of the really big bucks this year, which is awesome. Yet, uh, but she got you need to take her with you more often, right? Oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> awesome. And you have kids that want to go. She's she's uh, twelve years old now, and yet, uh, she just loves glasses and. She'll go out and spend the night with me on the mountain, and, and uh, it's just awesome. So, but she was with me when we found both of those. Actually, both of my daughters were with me the day we found that non-typical that Jack killed, which makes it even that much neater. And Because uh, one of them not as much into hunting, but she likes kind of going out for the adventure. So it was kind of neat. She got to see him, too. And then uh, same thing. He didn't he didn't move much. And uh, we in the first week of the season, 
when Jason was hunting, Jack was also in camp, and and uh, so we uh, while Jason and I were hunting the Iger buck, uh, we had them hunt the other buck, and uh, it was pretty neat. They they got on him, and uh, Paul and uh, Paul Stewart and Randy Elmer were the guys, and uh, they got on him twice. I think they got him on the day before and didn't get him, and then that morning they saw him go into a tree line real early, and uh, they figured he might come out early, so Jack took a gamble and got out in position, and he came out with uh, plenty of daylight that day, which he hadn't been doing all summer, and Jack was able to slip in on him and, and uh, made a great shot. I think that one went like two, right around 216 and then changed. Yeah, it's a beautiful buck, um, and then he and then he shot a big, big typical. Yeah, then you know that that typical is a buck. We, you know, Jack buys a couple of tags every year, so um, it, it's pretty awesome when that happens. And then he that took all the pressure off the big non typical. Then we decided to go, and uh, a couple weeks later, we we spent a bunch of time focusing on a big typical that we had hunted for the last two years and hadn't been able to kill, and uh, we lost him for probably oh. I think we lost him for three straight days. We had we had tried to push him intentionally, which we never do. And to this day, I still don't know why. I mean, and it was both of our decisions, mine and Jack. We thought he was moving into a direction where we didn't think he was going to be huntable. So we tried to get out in front of him and, and uh, kind of lightly bump him, thinking he would go back the other direction where we wanted him. We didn't want him to go that way. And it, it completely backfired. And we watched the buck run for a mile and a half without stopping and went into some real thick, uh, real thick haired over area. And he didn't come out for three days and, uh, we were just sick. We thought we'd blown the whole thing on him. And, and then on the last day or second to the last day, he came back out again within a hundred yards where he disappeared and Jack was able to slip in there and make a good shot. It was pretty exciting. It sounds like it. You know, one thing I would ask you, um, when you lose a big buck like that, or say when you bumped him thinking, you know, it just seems like anytime you try and do something like that, I've done it too. And it never seems to, they never seem to go where you want them to go. My question would be when you lose a buck like that, what is your mindset as far as do you, do you basically start looking for him the last place you saw him or do you leapfrog and try and anticipate where you think he will be? What what is like your first instinct when you're looking for a deer that you've lost? You kind of know where he is. Do you go back to the point of origination, or or, or what do you do? We were fortunate on that one because it was a real big look where he was, so we could see where he had gone towards and where he was living most of the time. So, but I typically, whenever I lose one, I almost exclusively go back to where their their home territory is and just wait for them to come back because they're going to come back eventually, you know, when they get bumped and it's just whether or not you're going to, it's going to be enough time left in the hunt, you know, but it, I just, I've never ever bumped one ever that left an area and then never did come back, you know? Um, right. So I just try to go back to where their home area is and, and, um, and just stay on it until they eventually show back up. And Greg, do you feel like if you bump a big bull as opposed to a big buck, w which one, in your opinion, would be harder to relocate, or which one would you assume that you would find quicker, a bull elk or a, a, a buck mule deer? I think a buck mule deer. Um, I just think they're so, especially the really big bucks, I just think they're so uh, territorial, or I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for, but they're so much more... Uh, Really big bucks just seem like they get into a real pattern, and they don't. They get comfortable for whatever reason. They don't like to leave it, and even when they do, they they're not comfortable in their new surroundings. They tend to go back. Whereas elk, I think, are, in my opinion, more nomadic. You know, um, and it's funny on these big mule deer. You know, the big bucks that we killed, they were uh, all three of them, pretty much stayed in one spot the whole time, uh, uh, kind of a, a real small home area. And yet you'll see other bucks come and go throughout the month that you're hunting them. You'll see them one time and never see them again. Smaller bucks constantly. And uh, it's just, I just think it's funnier that, that these little bucks will just kind of cruise all over, but the bigger bucks just stay. They just don't seem to want to move. I don't know if they're just comfortable there or, you know, they feel safe and that's the reason. But uh, I So think you would say, bucks, you would say these bit, have, they have a much tighter circle is what you're saying. Yep, I think the really big bucks have a much tighter circle than, 
just a, an average buck. You know, I think once they get to a certain age, they just kind of tend to, to get more uh, more grounded into one small area. You know, and obviously until right. the rut starts and then everything changes, you know. Yeah. Um, Greg, I know last time we talked about some gear. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, like, do you have specific gear that you lean on on all these hunts, you know, backpacks, um, you know, whatever, tripods, optics? Is there is Are there things that you really lean on? Yeah, we talked a lot about the optics already. Uh, as far as backpacks, I love the uh, the outdoorsmen. I use that. I have both of their, they have the extended, like they call it the long range. And uh, and then they have the regular outdoorsmen backpacks. And I love both of them. That long range one was a pretty neat idea they came up with where you know, it's got a zippered, uh, the whole top of it unzips and then it extends the length of it by about, you know, I guess at 12 inches to make it much longer. And then when you're not using it, you just stuff it in and zip it back up and it stays more compact. But, you know, Floyd and them have designed so many great products over the years and their backpacks are so well thought out as far as, uh, you know, they've got everything from sleeves on the side to just drop your tripods. And when you're moving, you just pick your stuff up and drop it real quick. You don't have to you know, cinch stuff up to it. And uh, I think it's by far the best pack, pack out of the market. been real happy with it. And then as far as clothing and gear, I love Sika gear. You know, I've been with Sika for probably 10 years now, and I just and I have nothing but great things to say about their product. I, I love it. Especially this year, they came out with a bunch of new stuff, and it seems like every year they come up with new and better stuff. So I've been happy with really both of those. Right on. So you're on the muzzleloader hunt right now, um, and then I would assume you've got rifle elk uh, a- after this. Um, uh, prognosis uh, for the late season hunts, uh, st- are you still uh, as optimistic as you were prior to the season? And, and throw in the late elk hunts as well. Well, I'm actually on the rifle deer right now here in Nevada, and um, you know, so far we've been seeing a lot of action, a lot of the deer. You know, we're hunting the same kind of deer that we were at the same bush we had found during the summer. We have not been able to locate uh, the target buck we're looking for right now. We're two and a half days into it. We haven't seen him yet. We've seen six or seven of the bucks that were in the area where he was. We just haven't been able to turn him yet. But I'm sure he's there. We're just, you know, this time of year, they just get so much, especially those bigger bucks, they get so much more nocturnal and and don't move around as much. So we're just going to keep pounding it. Hopefully he shows himself. As far as the late elks, uh, the late elk seasons. Uh, man, I'm really excited about Arizona. You know, from everything I've seen, I'm going to be doing the late hunts in 23, and and uh, you know the everything I've seen so far, the antler growth looked like it was phenomenal in 23 on the early hunts. I saw lots of really good bulls that got taken out of there. Uh, you know, not through us, just pictures. So I'm excited about doing that late hunt. We really don't start scouting that late hunt until you know November because you know they're just not in the same areas where they're going to be then that right now. Yeah, absolutely. And and what advice um, would you give to uh, Arizona late season hunters? And and maybe it's different for say Nevada late season elk hunters. Um, if you had to give a couple of tips for guys finding bulls on those late hunts in Arizona, what would they be? Just try to find places where they've got everything in a real close proximity. You know, those late season bulls they don't like to move much. As long as they've got, they try to find places that are away where they aren't. Gonna to get bumps with food and water. And if you can find places that have food and water that are remote, there's going to be bulls in them. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, is is Does the same hold true for Nevada as well, even though it's a little bit more open-type open, open type country? You know, not. I don't think it's as much in Nevada because there's just so much water in Nevada where these bulls are at. You know, you don't think of it <laughs> that way, but... These mountains, the, the bulls in Nevada are really funny. They're they're kind of the opposite of Arizona. It took me a few years to figure it out over here, but these bulls here don't, you know, they rut down low in winter up high. It, it's the opposite of what you would think, you know. Um, all these bulls that we hunt on the archery hunts that are down in the face of the mountains get way up in the nasty mountain, way up high, and they, they winter up there in the snow, and that just doesn't make sense. You'd think they'd all be down low in the big rolling sage country, and they aren't. So, and there's water so hot. Every one of these, almost every canyon in Nevada on these mountain ranges has water in it. So, you know, there's no way to like isolate it like it is in Arizona. So, so I just think in Nevada, just glass as much as you can in the high country. Awesome. Those, that's great advice there. Well, uh, Greg, I know you've got to get back to the hunt. I really appreciate you taking the time to um, chat with us. 
I uh, want to encourage uh, the listeners to go on Greg's Instagram. That's Greg underscore Krog. That's K R O G H. Um, you've got a real nice Instagram page. I noticed you've been adding some stuff on there, and there's some great mule deer and great elk on there. And um, uh, you can also go to Greg's uh, website at mogionrimoutfitters.com and uh, check out all of Greg's stuff. I uh, want to wish you the best for the remaining uh, couple of months here in the fall season. And uh, if 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 the next uh, go around is anything like the the initial part of your season, I can't wait to see uh, what you guys dredge out. And uh, just wish you the best of success over there. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. You take care. Okay. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card when signing up for the GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more, go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. 